You are listening to episode 48 of the Lewis and Kyle show with Guy Swan. I'm not saying don't hold other assets because Bitcoin is still to some degree experimental, but it's also been beaten to death and tested in the real world for a very, very long time. And it's a whole lot less experimental than it was eight years ago. Hello and welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where Lewis and I chat with experts in the areas that we want to learn about, whether that's real estate, entrepreneurship, or content creation. Every week, we bring on a different high performer and share their best ideas with you. Thank you for choosing our podcast. We are really grateful that you're here. In this episode, we chat with Guy Swan. Guy Swan is a Bitcoin expert who runs a content creation empire in the Bitcoin world. His podcast is called a Bitcoin Audible, where he reads the best articles coming out about Bitcoin every week, so you don't have to read them. And he also produces the podcast Shitcoin Insider, where he rails into the worst things happening in the crypto universe, so you can avoid them uh, at all costs. Guy was patient and kind enough to come on our show and answer all of our questions about Bitcoin, dumb or not. We answer topics like, will quantum computers break the encryption that holds Bitcoin together? Yes or no? Can a government decide, you know what, we're going to cancel Bitcoin? Is that possible? What makes Bitcoin valuable or is it even valuable in the first place? How do you get started holding your own Bitcoin? And some of the macro ideas underpinning how Bitcoin should work in theory. It was a super fun, eye-opening and educational chat. And I know that you are going to enjoy listening to it. So with that, no more BS for me. I'm just going to switch right over to our chat with Guy Swan. Guy, thank you very much for, for coming on our podcast. We're excited to talk with you about crypto, the space, Bitcoin, uh, and everything involved with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Appreciate it. I uh, had a fun chat on the little short version uh, last week and uh, a good to actually like really dive into it. I'm excited. Yeah, if, if you haven't heard, he's talking about the summit that Lewis and I are producing, the Grow Your Audience podcast summit. It'll be out in uh, hopefully around the same time, maybe as this interview, something like that. But anyways... Guy, if you could just tell us a little bit about how, before we dive into to what we're going to call a dumb question hour, because Lewis and I are by no means an expert in this space uh, in crypto. If you could just tell us a little bit how you went from being a uh, Time Warner U-verse at and technician to being a, a crypto thought leader and kind of what that time period of your life looked like where you were, we were transitioning to now where you're, you know, every day on the phone talking about Bitcoin, reading about Bitcoin. Uh, and kind of spreading the the gospel of Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was an internet technician for about four years and some change, maybe somewhere around there. And I actually found Bitcoin a little bit prior to that. It's uh, it's it's been a while now. I was working, like I've always been really techy and like science and math oriented, but it didn't super excite me for most of my life um and uh my my first love if you will um was film so uh, i actually went to film school and loved it and i really loved the production side of it and the orchestration of like you know spending eight hours to get one beautiful shot and like putting together a story like a pattern you know like i just i just everything about it was just a fascinating idea to me And so uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, after college, uh, my brother and I uh, were living out in the middle of nowhere, uh, just just trying to live on the cheap and trying to make something. And I was doing uh, I was running my own business at the time. I was running a media business, um, doing wedding videos and local commercials and little documentary things. So I just kind of like anything I could get my hands on to like play around with. And I was really loving it. But most of it was like just. I was kind of, I wasn't really like, I'm going to build this huge enterprise thing. I was just kind of like, this is fun. I'm enjoying myself. And so I was just doing it. And uh, at the time I was getting back into kind of nerd stuff. And maybe it was just that like, I love cameras and you know all the gadgetry and stuff like that. But I was like doing like internet history and like really kind of digging into stuff. And my brother was taking economics. And so uh, uh, he was back in school at that point and he was coming, he would come back and then he would just be like, like, so I learned this today in economics and it doesn't really make sense. Like if that, if that is actually true, if the principle they explained today was actually true or the model 
then what they taught us like a week ago could not possibly be true at the same time. Like there's like some serious contradictions in this Keynesian economics, which we didn't know, we didn't refer to it as Keynesian at the time. We didn't know how to distinguish it. Austrian economics, which is the, uh, the idea of kind of monetary systems and the, the economy itself as an organic thing rather than like a machine with gears, but a very, very complex environment that, uh, uh, that has its own kind of mechanisms for display, for sharing when there's an imbalance, for like showing what's wrong and it's why price controls don't work. It was just a whole boom and bust cycle theory that made so much sense. It was like shocking how like, what a breath of fresh air it was when we started digging into this stuff. And it was everything we had known about the last century and all the history that we thought we knew was suddenly like, it was like somebody turned on a light and we just saw all these aspects of it that make so much more sense than it did previously. And somewhere right in there where I was full on, like in my techie stuff, we were full on into economics and going down the Austrian economic rabbit hole and Bitcoin just kind of landed in our lap. Somebody, a friend of my brother's sent him a message and said, you would probably be interested in this Bitcoin thing because it's all about sound money and like hard verification and nobody in control sort of thing. And we were just enthralled. Like we were just like immediately. I remember, I remember this uh, because we were, I mean, it was like, we were just like unbelievably high, like, like on the <laughs> fact that this thing existed and it was, I remember we immediately started digging into the white paper and we were trying to find anything. And, and at the time there was almost nothing about it. Like there wasn't like podcasts really that you could listen to. It was really early. And uh, I remember we were just, we just been going off about how crazy this was and how it was going to change the world. And then like the sun was coming up, like we had just gone through the entire night talking and like digging into this thing. And uh, like we were eight hours down the rabbit hole, the very first eight hours that we'd heard about this thing. And literally that's kind of, that was it. I've been stuck ever since I, I started going. That's why I changed back towards the tech route. I was trying to get like my, uh, I became a technician at a, a spectrum and started working on like, like got my Linux admin certification and uh, that sort of thing. And I was trying to go into like server management and that that sort of thing that was kind of my direction that I was focused at the time um but then ended up landing and doing this podcast and at some point I was just like I gotta I gotta do this full time like I'd spent my whole time at uh, Spectrum driving around and working on telephone poles and fixing people's internet just listening just listening to every podcast every book mm -hmm. every anything and everything I get my hands on to learn about this stuff and I've basically been stuck there ever since. So, yeah, that's that's how I stumbled upon Bitcoin and why I can't leave. <laughs> so basically, you fell down a, a, a rabbit hole with turtles all the way down. And here you are today <laughs> talking to Lewis and myself about the exact same topic that you that you fell into. I guess it was 10 years ago now. Nine. But yeah, Nine yeah, somewhere, some, somewhere, somewhere around there. It's, it's been a long time. It's been a woof ups and downs, crazy times, made a lot of money, threw up when losing keys. And like, I mean, you wouldn't believe like in the early days of Bitcoin, it was literally the wild west. Like you just never know what the heck was going to happen. And everything was command line, like nothing. It was, it was so easy to run into a problem then because all of the all of the cushy walls and the easy software and the user interfaces just didn't exist then, but it's been an absolute crazy ride. And uh, it, it's nuts to think that it's been nine years at this point. That's amazing. Uh, kind of before we jump right into some of the dumb questions that we have for you about Bitcoin, could you tell us a little bit about what your, let's call it media empire in the Bitcoin space looks like? So no, you have a website, uh, a blog, more than one podcast. What's kind of your, your footprints in the Bitcoin space look like? Okay. Um, uh, my basically central area is uh, everything kind of revolves around Twitter um, just because uh, Twitter has such a huge Bitcoin community. And uh, I uh, have 
two podcasts, um, which I hope to expand. I've got the Crypto Economy Network, um, which is just the two shows right now. It's Shitcoin Insider and uh, and then the main one, Bitcoin Audible. Shitcoin Insider is really new. Um, we're three episodes in. Um, and uh, a Bitcoin Audible format of the show is uh, mostly me reading all the most brilliant pieces written about Bitcoin because there's literally an ocean of research papers and um, uh, you know um, like shelling out like the history of money, economics, game theory, protocol wars. Like I mean, just some of the the level of fascination. It's a super interdisciplinary uh, topic. Like you can hit it from literally 13 different angles and it's got something unique from every one of them and it's why it's so difficult to understand because if you only understand it from an economic sense you might really miss something a beautiful piece of its game theory or if you only understand it from like kind of the application and coding sense you're going to completely misunderstand the basis of its like monetary foundation and why it's built the way it is so, so again there's just like so many different topics to hit from and uh, Bitcoin Audible covers it all. And then I also have solo episodes where I kind of hopefully, you know, answer some questions like this, you know, like uh, direct people in the right way of how to hold their own keys and uh, how to think about certain perspectives and all that stuff. So it's, it's basically an all-in-one for Bitcoin things. And Shitcoin Insider is just exploring most of the scams and the mm -hmm. failures and kind of the wrong mindset the the polar opposite is you know go get my hands dirty and just have fun it's kind of my guilty pleasure <laughs> that's fun um, that's awesome um uh, yeah <clears throat> so kind of to dive in here it, it's something that you talk about a lot and i've heard you talk about a lot is like it being a monetary base for this new um financial system that will be created because of bitcoin um and I buy into that idea and like not getting into the technical aspects. Like, how do you think our, our world will like, what's going to change about my life as a, you know, normal person because of this new monetary system that you believe will be created. Okay. Uh, that list is actually pretty freaking huge. It will be a slow transition but it, it relies on kind of having to understand where the bulk of society's problems are. And this is deeply misunderstood by people, but the fundamental corruption of our money is, I mean, just in my opinion, hands down, no questions asked, the largest systemic global problem that we have. It leads to so many fundamental second and third layer issues that we are constantly hacking at the branches of and it seems like we don't get anywhere and the reason is because we're just hacking at the branches we're not seeing the underlying cause for the massive inequality the growing po po poverty the the endless wars that never end no matter who's in office the the unbelievable subsidies and corruption around government blue or red doesn't matter like it's just there it's a permanent part of the thing the uh, horrible debt imbalances how we increase debts every single year and the idea of austerity has just gone out the window when you think about money money is merely a it's just a mirror for actual resources and value in the economy so if we're running debts literally what that means if we're not paying it off is it means that we are consuming and destroying more resources than we are creating. Like that's, it is, it is literally a budgeting thing. If you have a negative 100 or 200 in a household budget, it means that you're losing stuff and eventually your house is empty. Now, nominally, because somebody's able to print money to make it appear as if we made a profit because you have an institution that can just print money arbitrarily. It's like cooking the books. It's, it, it's literally the exact same function. So in a household debt, if I'm losing $200 every month, it means that we're getting poor. It means that we're losing some good or something out of the house and things are getting poor. But if I'm able to cook the books for an extra $300, it can look like we ran a profit for the month and then everybody's happy and you know we put on a smile, but it feels like everything's getting crappier. 
it feels like I'm running on a hamster wheel and not getting anywhere. I'm running as fast as I can to get a 10% raise that only seems to afford me exactly what I was getting last year. And that is fundamentally because of the corruption of our money. To print money is to just lie about what happened to real resources. Money is nothing. It's money is a, it's a proxy. It's a promise about real resources. You can't do anything with money. Like, what are you going to do? You can, you know, roll it up and, you know, snort some Coke with it or like maybe wipe your butt. But, you know, you know, that's not why it's valuable. It's just a piece of paper. The idea is that it's actually representative of real resources that moved somewhere else in the economy, of real labor that somebody else put into it. And if somebody can just counterfeit a trillion dollars out of thin air, just poof, and suddenly we've got a trillion more dollars, it means that a trillion dollars of real labor and its effect on the economy, a trillion dollars of you deciding not to go to a movie, but instead to stay in and you know save your money a little bit so that you can afford gas for the trip next weekend or something. All of these difficult economic decisions, every time that a mother chooses to feed their child instead of buy a dress, a trillion dollars worth of that is just deleted from influence in the economy. It's, it's, it's as if those people don't exist. Their hardships don't exist. Their economic choices don't exist. That is the source of 98% of the inequality in this world. The ability to print money and give it to rich people, to give it to politically connected people, and to that you have a price of money that's very high, and they have a price of money that's very low, because someone somewhere can just invent it out of thin air. That is the, that is the problem that Bitcoin is trying to solve. No one should have control of the money. Everyone should have the same rules about who can consume value. If you don't produce anything, you don't get to take it from somebody else. And that's the underlying principle. Everyone plays by exactly the same rules, and they are fully verifiable down to the 1,000th of a cent worth of value, and nobody cheats it. Nobody gets a special key to just take half of it from everybody else. It's kind of the basis of human rights. You know, like if I invest my time and my money and my energy into something, my blood, sweat and tears, it's mine. You don't get to just take it because, you know, it's really helpful for your crony to get a subsidy. And that's kind of, that, that's where it's all born from. And there's just so many second and third layer problems that stem from that. And you, you solve that and you solve so many of those problems. So, the transition to this new currency will solve mm -hmm. those 98% of problems. I have just like one question, one problem with what you're saying there. And that okay. is that like the creation of a trillion dollars, like the print, the printing of the government of a trillion dollars, like that money, a trillion dollars creates way more than a trillion dollars in the economy sure. because yeah. all that money goes to, to deposit accounts and then those deposited accounts, you know, I don't know the exact number, but a bank only has to keep 90 per, or only has to keep 10% of that deposit in reserve. So they loan, sorry. So they loan that yep. money out and then that keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And the argument mm -hmm. is that that is what is spurring the economy to, to allow companies to invest in new equipment invest in progress so that the lives of that 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 single mother the life of that single mother is mm -hmm. better because she gets a job she gets these things so i'm not disagreeing with you it's just that like you know i i don't agree with the premise that if you print a trillion dollars it only goes into the hands of the rich like it it, it is Think about um, it. what is that what is that 10 percent what is that referring to? They're loaning it. Mm -hmm. It's a loan. So think about, think about the oh, idea there you of, go. Yeah, I, yeah. think about okay. of creating a million dollars into existence as a loan. I have zero dollars. You have zero dollars. We're like, now mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're completely just dead. Even I get the special uh, banking license, corporate privilege 
of inventing a loan out of thin air. Mm -hmm. I get to take out a loan from the government at 0% interest, which is what it is right now, which is insane. Mm -hmm. And then I get to loan it to you at 10% interest. I did this solely out of political privilege. Mm -hmm. I own a $1 million asset and you have a $1 million liability. I did nothing and you have no reason to loan it to, you have no reason to pay it back to me. I just invented a million dollars for me plus 10%. I have done nothing at all. I've produced nothing into the economy. This is why the bank. Yeah. Is the I mean, I agree. Building. Like banks, yeah. banks are not. Yeah. Like just the long-term outlook for banks just isn't there. Like we're, we're recording with Taylor Pearson next week and he talks mm-hmm. about uh, sort of these new, these new paradigm shifts that happen. And his argument is that it went from Kings to bankers to corporations, yeah. to now it's going to be entrepreneurship. And, mm-hmm. you know, banks were, were too back. Like we are, we are moving forward as a society from the idea yeah. of a bank. And, you know, I'm interested in real estate. So like, I've been, I've been thinking about the, sort of the intersection of DeFi, Bitcoin and real estate. And it's like, well, if you mm-hmm. could tokenize a building and like have a contract where the, or smart contracts where like it only gets funded if you're able to, per, if you're able to, to fund those, those tokens and then have that set price for the building, like that would eliminate the need for a, a debt market, you know, like get, sort of the game in real estate is who, who can get the best terms on, on debt, you know, in order to, in order to buy this real estate and get good leverage. And it's like, that would be unnecessary in the future, in a future with, Mm -hmm. with crypto being sort of the, the top layer that, or that base layer that you're talking about. So, yeah, I mean, I'm fully with you. Yeah. There's so much that could be smoothed out and so many huge issues that could be solved just from, just from actually taking advantage of like uh, crypt cryptographic means of authentication and Mm -hmm. like, Uh, And that's kind of the beauty of something like Bitcoin is just to own some Bitcoin basically means that you you have now like it's one of the biggest deployments of public private key cryptography to get a public key into the hands of individuals that's ever happened. And uh, you see now I don't understand what you're saying. Oh, okay, okay. Well, we'll 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 get back to that. But the other thing, the other thing I was talking about, I know it's a whole lot to unpack to try to think about the debt, the debt problem, and how it can um, cause so many problems in society. But the underlying issue is that, like, when you talk about the ten percent reserves, Mm -hmm. is that it means that if, in the same way, it's it's if use the example again that I give you a loan is if I have a hundred thousand dollars which this, this, this reserve ratio is actually 0% now. Since the most recent crisis, it's disappeared. But I have $100,000. It means that I can loan out a million dollars to you and earn interest on it. It, is literally the, it literally means that if you want $900,000, you have to work your butt off. You have to make hard economic choices. If I want $900,000, I just need your 100,000 and I can invent it for myself and loan it to other people. A loan is not a gift. A loan is not a gift. It is imprisonment. It is trapping you in the service of somebody else. If they never earned that money, the hell if they should be able to give you a loan. That's like saying that you have to work for me for three days because why? Because I traded you for something? No, just because I decide that you have to work for me for three days. A loan is a liability. It is not an asset. There is nothing nice or virtuous or charitable about giving somebody a loan. It is making someone subservient to you. It is great for the bank, not the debtor. And, uh, but trying to unravel why, like you say that the mother needs the loan or the business needs the loan and the mother needs the job. You know, it looks like it's the, it's the first order effect. It's, It's what's visible. It looks like it's keeping the economy alive. Why is it keeping the economy alive though? It's because they're going to lose those jobs if, Uh, they can't pay down their debts. Like if we Mm. weren't, if we weren't literally drowning in debts, the bank, the business wouldn't need a loan to stay afloat. Yeah. You're kind of saying that the solution to the problem is the source of the problem at the same time. 
That's interesting. Yes. Yes, it is the source of the problem. And the reason everybody constantly needs a loan is to pay off the previous loan and to deal with the fact that prices are so high that they're unaffordable. And the only reason prices constantly rise is because we keep issuing new money, is because every time the bank gets $1, they turn it into 10. Why do you think healthcare goes up every year? Why do you think education goes up by 25% year over year? Why does the price of a car go up? Why does the price of rent and housing go up? All of these things increase constantly because they are constantly issuing new dollars. It necessarily cannot increase in price if there is not an increase in dollars. The only way it could is if there was a decrease somewhere else. The natural state of technology and the natural state of production is for everything to get cheaper. It's not harder to build a house today than it was 30 years ago. It's hard. Like... I, I'm like so stuck in in like the old way and in like <laughs> my, in my accounting and finance yeah. degree that it's it's difficult for me to like let go of, of these things and and see what new paradigms from, mean. Right, right, and, and <laughs> that's I get the whole that. point. And I, of hope, the word. And I hope I'm recognizing that. But one question that I have for you that I think is apt mm-hmm. in in this moment is like, well, what is it about Bitcoin specifically? that uniquely suits it to be the basis of this new monetary system that is not present in other um, cryptos? Okay. Uh, There's a couple of things. Uh, One is that just in a general comparison to the legacy system, the beauty of Bitcoin and the uniqueness of Bitcoin is that it is corrupt proof I guess you could say it is 100% verifiable from top to bottom. Uh, Like I said earlier, there's no secret keys. There's no master. There's no, you know, 1-800 number to call to reverse accounts. Like it just, none of that exists. It is decentralized and therefore the owner is the owner hands down end of, sto- end of story. And it doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're in, doesn't matter where you, whether you move from the US to Russia, it is the way it is. Bitcoin is global, Bitcoin does not care and has no idea that politics even exists um, from, a, from a protocol standpoint. And, uh, and it is sound money. And that is the ultimate focus. The, the, and I've talked about this in the recent Shitcoin Insider, actually, which we, again, with Shitcoin Insider, you know, take that with a grain of salt. All we do is we just kind of rail against the rest of crypto just because it's fun. Um, and I think the mindset is totally wrong. But again, take it as fun, like, like we are just kind of poking. Uh, but uh, the underlying mindset is that the blockchain, the cryptography, SHA-256, the mining, all of this exists in Bitcoin, not because we want all of those things, but because all of those things are the, the, make the system that is necessary to secure sound, incorruptible money. That is the goal. Sound, incorruptible money. And specifically that which is on its own infrastructure. It doesn't care if the banking, the bank hours are open. Doesn't care if the NASDAQ turns their computers on in the morning. None of those things have to happen. Bitcoin is its own unique beast that is completely external to all of it. And because of that, it's an insanely strong foundation to build something off of. The blockchain is completely undesirable. It's just necessary. It's the only way that we could solve that problem. And 99.9% of crypto, I literally have not found a project that does not, that really properly understands this perspective, thinks that the point of the token is to make the blockchain exist rather than the blockchain is there to secure the token. Hmm. Money is a language. You know, like, like, do we really see a future where everybody speaks their own language, where you speak Klingon and Lewis speaks Dothraki and I speak Mandarin? Like, no, we, we all speak one language so that we can actually work together. So the idea that we're going to have an individual currency for everything. Now, we can tokenize things that exist in the real world. We can tokenize a house um, because that's just equity. 
that just uh, just a digital point that represents the trade of something that exists in the real world. But for a money, mm -hmm. the idea of money and the value of money is independence and verification. It's that promise that what you own is in fact yours and cannot be cheated by somebody else. That's the value of gold. That's why gold was money for so long is because you could actually verify the atomic structure and nobody could cheat it. That's mm -hmm. why it made good money. Archimedes is because, and, yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't, there, there never was uh, the, the Midas touch, you know, like it, it never happened. And because of that, it remained a secure monetary policy, no matter who got their hands on it, no matter how many dictators and kings and, you know, tried could to you, change it. Yeah. I love this answer. Just, could you briefly just define um, sound money? Like what that means? Cause okay. yeah. Sound money basically means honest money. It uh, like right now, the dollar, um, there are a couple of institutions, uh, specifically banks, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, and technically the Treasury, even though they've basically handed it over to the Federal Reserve since 1913, who can just create money out of thin air, who can just, just poof. Every, if for everybody else, it's legal to counterfeit. For them, it's their job. For, for them, they have to counterfeit for the greater good they have to consume trillions of dollars worth of equities out of the um, economy. And God. I feel I really feel like it would be good for everybody if I could just buy up all the stuff, but you know, whatever. Uh, counterfeiting is bad because it's cheating. <laughs> it means that everybody else has to work and you don't have to, and you get all of their stuff. And that's a lie. That means that everybody else told the truth. Okay, I worked this many hours. I had to build a thing that somebody else actually valued and voluntarily trade with them. Whereas counterfeiting is saying, I did all of that, even though you didn't. Well, it is, when you say counterfeiting, I mean, they're, they're selling treasury bonds. They are saying that they're going to pay that money back in the future. That's how they're, so like, you're right. Like they are like just saying that out of thin air, like, sure, we're going to do that. You know what I mean? Without much, mm -hmm. like they've always paid them back, but they can always just sell more treasury bonds because they, they yeah. force the purchase of those treasury bonds. So it's like it ends up I, I'm I'm kind of simplifying the process, but what ends yeah. up happening is you're that right. there's a greater number of dollars. Right. Oh, what? Yeah. no, no, it's a it's an important clarification. You're right. But it's just at like two, three steps down the line. The end result is simply that more money is created in the economy and more people get access to massive amounts of capital that right. should not have access to the capital. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm skipping those steps, but you're, right. you're absolutely right. I'm it sorry. It's a little bit the, more convoluted than that. The second year finance degree here is just, or third year, it's, just, <laughs> it's gotta come I, I out. I totally get it. Uh -huh. I, I totally get it. It's, it's good to bring it up because I do generalize. Um, uh -huh. uh, but um, oh, crap, what was the... Oh, sound money, sound money. Okay, so sound money is honest money. Uh, sound money means that it's the same rules for everyone. There is no one who can cheat it. There's no fake gold. It's just you either have the gold or you don't. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is perfect. People steal gold. People steal Bitcoin. Uh, uh, you know, banks confiscate it. Governments confiscate it, like all this stuff. And each one of them has their their advantages and their disadvantages. But Bitcoin in this sense is uh, money that has a very clear, explicit monetary policy, like how many will exist. There are going to be 21 million Bitcoin. That is it. There will never be another. There will never be one 100 millionth more than that. 21 million, end of story, no questions asked. Nobody can change it, play or don't play but you are an equal participant like everybody. And that is, that is like one plus one equals two, right? Like in terms of, yeah. it, it, yeah. it, it, there is no uh, immutability to that statement because of the um, math behind the creation of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's it's, it's the, as simple a money from a monetary policy standpoint there are no subjective reasons why we're going to cheat the rules it's not like is if enough if enough people say we really want a pool and we can't afford one that oh well we'll just cheat these accounts to have this mm -hmm. amount of money because at the end of the day it's all subjective like it's all just it, all that means is that whoever has the keys to manipulate it will value what they need and what they want more than someone else 
So it becomes a game of whoever is in charge simply determines what value is rather than the economy and all the people in, uh, which is, which is antithetical to the free market. Like a free market works because everybody has input over what the value of money is. Everybody has input on what the value of a car is. Everybody gets to say, oh, I'm going to buy a car today or I'm not based on whether they can afford it and uh, whether or not it is valuable to them in comparison to some alternative where they're not going to ride a bike or they're going to buy a smaller oh. car or something more efficient. Uh, they make the choices and therefore the prices reflect that. But when a political system can just manipulate it to the order of trillions and trillions of dollars, all of that influence, all of that market directive from the people, the democratization of the measurements of all of those values vanish and it just becomes who politically decides what's important. Interesting. Uh, I'm so taking it in. You know, I'm thinking about, I'm, th I'm thinking about yeah. 1971 and like the gold standard <laughs> and how like that yeah. had to have all, like what you're saying had to have stopped, changed when we came off the gold standard, right? Because like, your argument mm -hmm. wasn't true before then, right? Mm -hmm. Or what do you what do you mean ex like exactly that? The when state they were, I guess they would different? print dollars and devalue one dollar against whatever one measurement of gold would mm -hmm. have been. But yes, when we detached ourselves entirely from one dollar being worth any amount of gold, that is when. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm basically. Sort of, working through it, it in my own head yeah so what happened in 1971 was uh this is why i go back to some like the great depression and the the huge debt bubble that we had in the 20s that one was show excuse me that one was so short-lived from the early 20s to late 20s and then crash into the great depression that that debt bubble that debt bubble is exactly what we've been going through for about 50 years now they just had it on steroids. And the reason it crashed so early, whereas this one has gotten orders of magnitude larger, is because it was supposedly backed by gold. So basically, people could call the debts due. They could say, well, I want my gold. Um, like there was, there was basically a way to see, oh, crap, we are clearly over leveraged. We are clearly in a problem and this has run its course. You can only manipulate interest rates so much if at the end of the day, somebody can withdraw a real good, a real resource in the economy. Because uh, a way I uh, like to explain it, uh, an episode, I think it's a story about booms and busts, maybe. It's a guy's take from ages ago. But it's a really great analogy that uh, my brother actually kind of uh, planted the seeds for, and I kind of ran with it, is that think of money like a set of car keys, and uh, the, the real resources are the car. Like, it doesn't matter how many keys you have if the number of cars don't change. And you can say, oh, we're giving out keys. This means more people can drive places because we think of keys as being able to get into a car and go somewhere. But in reality, there's still, at the end of the day, only so many cars. So a debt bubble, and this plays out on the order of decades, so it's very, very hard to see. And uh, a debt bubble is like everybody goes, not everybody needs their car at the same time, right? Like most of the time it's sitting like my car right now, sitting unused in the driveway. This is the case for like 90% of people and their cars. Mm -hmm. And so let's say we all parked our cars in a car bank and uh, instead we got a certificate. We got a key that allowed us to go get our car when we needed it. Well, technically they could get away with loaning out cars that they didn't have, giving out more keys because they know people aren't going to all come get their car at Ooh. the exact same time. So maybe four people have keys to my car and I just don't know because they'll always, everybody drives the exact same car, exact same color, you know, in this example. And, uh, and I don't know because I just go, you know, my car is there every time I need it. You only and need it 10% of the time. This is only actually, need it 10% of the time. Good, okay. Only need it 10% yeah. of the time. But here's the beauty of it is because they're giving away so many keys, people make plans assuming they have a car. So maybe next summer I'm going to go on a vacation. I rent, I rent a cottage. I rent a cottage at the beach. 
and uh, so does somebody else. They're they're gonna go to uh they're gonna go to a game the same day, and then uh, somebody else is going to uh, take a vacation. Somebody else is gonna go on a work trip. They've got a conference scheduled for the same time. And it looks like all this economic activity is happening. Look at all these reservations. Look at all these bookings. Stocks are going up. Everything's great. Look at all the cottages we rented out. Well, I'm a restaurant that, that is near the cottage and the whole beach is booked up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire a new waitress. I'm going to hire uh, a new cook. Everybody's expanding. Somebody's adding on to their uh, hotel. And everything looks beautiful. Numbers are going up everybody, everywhere. Everybody's got keys. Then a year later, when I take my car out and then the person takes the car out going to the conference, suddenly we're losing cars out of the bank, but we've still got a thousand keys thinking they're about to go on this trip. And suddenly the bank is empty. Suddenly the actual resources, we realize that there's a real problem and about 90% of the people can't go on their trip. And then they cancel the cottage. The waitress gets fired the the uh, hotel defaults on their loan that they expanded um, and everything crashes we get a boom for nine years because everybody is certain that the car exists but all we did was print keys so that is what happens when you print money and you issue debts that nobody can afford this is coming how do we how do i position myself to come out on top divest sell your keys for something of me uh, that means something sell your keys for bitcoin <laughs> um uh, that is literally that, that like bitcoin sell your keys is for resources basically for, for resources. literal hard not able to be abstracted and infinitely replicated literally literally computers hard drives like raw yes. materials oil barrels of oil yes uh real by estate. real things real estate Real estate, equities, Bitcoin. So I have a question about real estate on that line of thinking. Okay. How's real estate's just, the question I have about it is real estate's value is tied to the dollar. I just feel like real estate is still affixed to the system that would crumble. Whereas a, whereas a resource that is just objectively useful, let's say like farmlands and its ability to produce food for people. That's and like the, the food stays yeah. valuable with or without like an economic system to arbitrate the value. Uh, whereas real estate, you know, and it's not kind of thinking crisis mode here. Try Here's one problem. more example other than farmland, I think, but yeah. <laughs> Here's a problem with real estate is that it's deeply attached to the ability to get loans. Um, so real estate has a huge premium on it specifically to store value because cash sucks at it because there's no yield on treasuries because there's, uh, there's no, um, uh, cash is, you know, you're losing 10% a year. If you look at the, like, ignore the CPI, which is a nonsense indicator and do something very simple. Go back to the one plus one equals two idea. There's something called the chap wood index. That is a inflation measure in like top 100 cities, I think, uh, around the country. And it is literally just the top 100 products that are purchased by people uh like every single year index. in in yeah in aggregate to uh measure inflation and it shows that we get about 10 to 11 percent a year the cost I, of I really like uh michael saylor because yeah. everybody guy had michael saylor on his podcast which is crazy that was a great he's episode like, yeah. he's the the bull of bulls right now but um i really like his metaphor about cash he, you know he had I think $700 million in cash. And he likens it to a big piece of ice that's melting at a rate of 10% per year. Yeah. And that's, it's exactly what yeah. you're saying, right? It's like, yeah. you know, if you just hold dollars, if you're not divesting into assets that, that make money, then you are, you've got ice that's going to melt away. Yeah. Eventually. Or even neutral assets. You know, and then something like real estate is, it looks like you're nominally, like in the fact that the numbers are going up, it looks like you're nominally making a lot of money, but really what you're doing is you're keeping your value while the value of the money falls. Uh, so you've got something that you can turn around and sell later. And that's why I like a third, uh, God, sorry, if the, I don't know how loud that is. Dogs are going nuts. We got somebody outside. 
Uh, but the that's why a third of the luxury apartments in New York are empty. It's just wealthy people parking value because they got nowhere else to put it. There's a big premium on real estate because nothing else holds value. You can't just store. You can't have a savings account. You get paid 0.15% if you're lucky on a savings right. account, account. That's garbage. Of course, everybody's in debt. Of course. There's no incentive to save. The one well, their incentive is to incentive collect to more save. debt. Exactly. Exactly. You get yeah. If you can get debt cheaper, I mean, I'm refinancing my house. Like, I'm playing the game. Like, it's right. the proper, it's the quote-unquote smart thing to do with the, the rules that they're laying out is you get a cheaper interest rate debt to pay off your high interest rate debt. It's well, I crazy. mean, so like, as a, like it, this comes true and there's a huge debt bubble burst. Like, the banks aren't going to collect every house in America and every piece of real mm -hmm. estate. Like, like, is it a debt jubilee? Is that what happens? Is it just all right, let's reset. Like, let's just switch to Bitcoin. Like, what, what does that look like? What, is, you know, I buy into the idea that there's going to be some huge, crazy crash, but like, mm -hmm. well, there's probably a couple things. So I don't think we'll see, usually that would represent that, that would see huge deflation, right? Um, is if you have credit crises across the economy. And, uh, but I think, I mean, kind of the, the malicious beauty of uh, removing yourself from the gold standard is that the bill never has to come due. You can just inflate. You can just continue to accelerate your, your inflation, which is what's happening. I mean, look at how much, like our, our, you know, 10 years ago, the astronomical insane, can't believe it, higher than it ever has been uh, deficit was like, 900 billion dollars and this year it's like six trillion like you know like like we continue to make last year's look silly and uh that's a never-ending cycle if you look at it, it's a freaking hockey stick uh and that's going so to continue so we can do that forever well we can do it forever but the more it accelerates the poorer everybody gets like it is not it, it, it is no coincidence that this is also the age of protest. This is the age of hating the corporate welfare of uh, feeling a total and complete distrust. Like all of that is deeply connected. Everybody feels that they're going nowhere and things aren't getting better. And that's because of what is happening. And that inflation is much worse this year just the first half of 2020, uh, we already hit like 11 or 12%. We're probably going to see 20% this year. And I don't think it will draw back down. I think we'll see that again next year or more so. And uh, suddenly it'll cost $2,000 to just fill up a general grocery cart. And uh, everybody who earns a wage will be poorer than they've ever been. And will have to do something like UBI or potentially a jet debt jubilee, but I think they will use it to rope people into stricter, harder controls. This stuff like the central bank digital currency, you know, no, no crisis ever goes to waste. If they create a crisis, they're definitely going to make sure that they get more control out of it. And uh, the CBDCs are a great example. They're literally just attaching a bank account at, a, at the Federal Reserve to people's social security number and they can just hand out money but at that same time they also have a direct line into everything you spend on everything you do they can freeze your account they can tax you out of it they can they can issue and do whatever the hell they want for whoever the hell they want and i mean that's like 1984 level like we just run the show and they've got a direct line into everybody's everything that's why that's why i'm trying to figure out how to live entirely on bitcoin because i don't want to play that game i don't care if it means my debt goes away i'm not like i just don't play that that's a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh some serious i just like zoned in so hard uh i'm like oh i have to talk whoa uh, completely <laughs> not doing the uh i know we, we talk sometimes on this podcast about uh have like good conversations generally speaking and the whole you don't want to have be thinking the whole time about what you're going to say next and i was putting absolutely zero thought into what i was <laughs> going to say next uh because i was just busy actually listening and thinking so it's kind of the two-step thing is so 
I mean, I don't, God, Kyle and I are just not even properly equipped to make a strong counter argument as to, you know, this isn't coming at some point. And I don't think you've given us a clear, you know, time horizon, but we clearly buy into the urgency of taking some individual measures to be in a slightly better position than everyone else who does not see this coming. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's divest from cash into other f stores of value and potentially mm -hmm. Bitcoin is one of those stores of value. And that yeah. is something you are actively skin in the game doing day by day. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I have, uh, uh, there's a company, there's a couple companies that do it, um, but uh, referred to as DCA dollar cost average. I use a uh, Swan Bitcoin, but like cash app does it too. Yeah, is that your company? Um, Sorry. No, like, it has nothing to do with me. I did, Swan, I did work. Swan. Yeah. Chief I know Swan. I was so like, many people. Yeah, so yeah. many people have asked me that and I did actually work with them for a short while and they also sponsored the show for a short while and I still work with their team like I, I, I love these guys I, masterminds. I've, I've always known like I know everybody who works there like I'm good friends with all of them so they're like really really tight solid Bitcoin crew but uh no I don't actually I don't own or like I'm not mm -hmm. part of that company. I didn't start that company. I'm um, okay. just a uh, close friends. It's the it's a reference to Black Swan, not Celebians. Swan for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's DZA, and like you could just buy Bitcoin. I just set it to buy fifty dollars a week. But honestly, how long have you been doing that for? Um, ever since Swan Bitcoin had it available, I basically was like on it, like like that. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for that for a long time. Uh, but uh, I don't know, this year maybe. I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're a relatively new company. So um, I do anything and everything. Like I'm, I'm not, like I, I consider it, like I measure my amount of investment as how much I'm still trapped in the dollar, not how much I'm in Bitcoin. Like, like, so I don't, I don't have like an allocation to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is my money and I have an allocation that I have to deal with in dollars. Interesting. Um, so like any and everything that I have is in Bitcoin unless I need it and I can't directly access it through Bitcoin. And, uh, and not only that, like when, when we're talking about like divesting from the alternative infrastructure or cash or whatever it is, the reason, the reason I'm specifically in Bitcoin is because it's the most versatile and uh, there's something referred to as deep versus shallow security uh, deep, deep versus shallow protection. And it means how well do you know you own it and how many counterparties are, it, are you at risk with? So uh, something that has like kind of a mid-level protection is uh, real estate is that yes, nobody can inflate it. Like nobody can like devalue your real estate very quickly or easily but you are also entirely dependent on the jurisdiction. If your county, state, or the federal government decides you don't own it and they come in and civil asset eminent forfeiture domain. for whatever reason, eminent domain, um, this sort of thing, then you don't have the house. Gold is a little bit deeper protection. You can hide it in, on your person. You can hide it in your house. You can bury it in your backyard and maybe they don't know where it is. You can keep it some degree secret. Uh, so... Yes, maybe they could outlaw it like in the 19, what was it? 71, wasn't it? Uh, no, no, not the outlawing of the holding of it. I think it was 33. I think that's right. Uh, you it. said 33 on a podcast like uh, that that's I was probably to it, earlier. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, when they outlawed the holding of gold and uh, basically confiscated it from individual citizens. Um, uh, well, technically you can have it and not tell anybody. You know, so like you have like a slightly deeper protection there. You can't really tell anybody that you don't have a house. You know, that's pretty obvious. And then there's really shallow protection, cash. It can be easily confiscated. You're almost always having it in a bank. Paper cash has a deeper protection. Digital cash, obviously terrible. Banks can freeze it. Your local officials can freeze it. Your state can freeze it. The federal government can freeze it. Like it can be frozen and taken from you a billion different ways. And it can be diluted and is diluted all the time, every day, by the banks, by the Federal Reserve, by the U.S. government, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas then there is super crazy deep protection. And uh, Bitcoin is about as far to that end of the spectrum as you can get. There is no, it doesn't matter on your jurisdiction. It doesn't matter like 
what a judge says. Uh, they can, you know, break your knees and make you give them your keys, but uh, getting access to it from you, uh, it doesn't matter which jurisdiction you're in, which political system you're under, um, as long as you got an internet connection, you got it. And obviously, it's just information. So it's about as easy to hide as hiding a thing gets. So that is why I think it's both got the best growth potential because it's an entirely alternative financial infrastructure and, uh, and is growing massively and seeing tons and tons of development. So it's really at the beginning of its growth phase. And uh, then at the same time, it's also a far deeper protection than most other assets. I'm not saying don't hold other assets because Bitcoin is still to some degree experimental, but it's also been beaten to death and tested in the real world for a very, very long time. And it's a whole lot less experimental than it was eight years ago. Uh, so yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's why, I mean, I, I have a house and like, I don't wreck, I don't tell people to not buy real estate or houses or whatever. It's still a good mid-level protection, but, uh, it is definitely why I suggest Bitcoin. If you know what you're doing, if you learn it and you hold it, it's a great way for deep savings to save a good chunk. That's basically your, the shit hits the fan ticket, you know, <laughs> like it's just the, yeah. the end all be all set of your savings. So one thing that I like have a problem with is mm -hmm. like, pomp tweets out like anybody that's in the crypto space for like bitcoin eighteen thousand, like super ex like this is awesome it's worth yeah. 350 billion dollars there uh, but like that tie to the dollar and the mm -hmm. fiat system in general mm -hmm. to me it's like how would we measure the value Seems reverse right like how, how would we measure the value of a Bitcoin without pegging it to the dollar, the dollar. Yeah. It's a problem of standards. It's like, you know, you tell me this thing's 20 kilometers away. I'm like, okay, how many miles is that? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm doing yeah. that. Right. And uh, so <clears throat> the, this is this, this problem with value is even worse. Like it's a much harder standard to break because it is a relative, it's, it's a phenomenon that's entirely relative. The value of the money is based on a portion of the value of the economy that it is operating in. So basically you ask the same question in reverse. How do you know what a dollar's worth? Mm -hmm. Like we're measuring it against a dollar, but like what's the, what do we measure a dollar against? Right. Like it, again, it's all relative. We don't an have an average of a couple of things you can trade dollars for. Sure. Which, you could do the exact same thing with Bitcoin. It's just exactly. because the dollar is the standard. The dollar is the the meter or the foot or whatever of money. Uh, it's I mean, it's 80 percent of, you know, capital assets the world over, like in debt instruments and stuff like it's it is the dominant currency. It's the language the of global reserve. value. The global reserve exactly mm -hmm. um and because of that everything gets measured against it but bitcoin is also in its monetization phase it's really fun when number go up you know like mm -hmm. number go up yay happy hooray, right. hooray. <laughs> for um, sure <laughs> but uh at the end of the day it's about how well this thing has survived does it continue to do its job and is it still sound and secure against any and all adversaries and because of that its value relative to other things will continue to go up the more it simply survives uh if, if saving that you know bitcoin simply doesn't die i see massive growth potential um you know, not financial advice whatever but uh um uh because of that, Bitcoin is still in its monetization phase and it will only be measurable in other things. But there will come a point where every time Bitcoin goes up in value, it will be represented in the fact that something else went down in value relative to it. 
-hmm. and it will simply start, it will simply stop making sense to value it in things like the yuan or in things like the dollar. Maybe it makes more sense to value it in gold before it becomes a bigger market than that. Or like water or like the volume of something. Something. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it, 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 it's a, it's very difficult because it's an abstract idea. Yeah, exactly. But essentially it's however big the economy is that is using it. The, the people who are saving in it, the number of people who are investing, the number of people accepting it in payments, the growth of the lightning network, the financial instruments attached to it, et cetera, et cetera. It's all of that stuff divided by 21 million. That is what it's worth. Right. So it's everything connected to it economically divided by 21 million. That is roughly what the purchasing power of Bitcoin will be. And I think that will continue to go up for a long time. It's such yeah, an odd idea. It's like, so let me, to, to follow up on that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when I listen to things about DeFi or, or mm -hmm. uh, YouTube it or whatever, it's like, the stable coin seems to be like this innovation within it that's like allowing for DeFi to, to blossom. But what is the value of a stable coin if its value is pegged to a dollar? I guess it's the same question. I mean, it's just very abstract and like impossible to answer, but it just seems so interconnected with the fiat system that Bitcoin and crypto is, is so desiring to be away from that it's like difficult for me to understand what the like it just seems like a conflict of interest to me yeah the problem with DeFi in like like the the value of quote-unquote DeFi, like as you would think of it decentralized finance is the fact that it's there's no counterparty is that like it operates outside of someone else that it's not centralized to one issuer or one company or one server somewhere. And the, the overwhelming majority of stuff on DeFi, this was the first episode of Shitcoin Insider. And, you know, we did really probably about half the episode is jokes and just ragging on them. And the other half is like actually digging into the realistic things about DeFi and trying to explain it because there is a basis of, like some code about like essentially what are referred to as atomic swaps, the ability to swap one token for another without having a third party involved that you can just do this with contracts on the fly that just like exist in the ether. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like Uniswap or whatever. But the problem is, is that everybody's getting paid in tokens that are just arbitrary. So they're creating sushi tokens and yam tokens and they're not equity for anything. They're just creating tokens. So it's, almost identical to the ICO bubble back in 2017 is people just creating tokens, printing millions of them, selling them, and everybody's rushing to buy it before it collapses. And then when it collapses, they move on, they move from yams to sushi, from sushi to like, but they're, again, it's just, it's just like buying points on a Google ledger. And every time the points start declining in value, you issue up a new Google ledger with a bunch, bunch of new points on it and everybody chases it. But the value of having it like decentralized as a form of swapping things would be great and kind of is great on its face. But if you're if it's con completely connected to USDC, which I think is like the mm -hmm. overwhelming majority of it, mm -hmm. these are just dollars in Coinbase accounts. Right. So Coinbase can turn to just hit a button and turn the whole thing off. So it's not decentralized. And that's where it really fell apart is that they still couldn't solve the where do the funds come from and they're wholly reliant basically on coinbase so it's it's just a layer on top of coinbase right now maybe so that is a okay yeah it sounds like i asked you a question then uh, that, it seems to yeah. be that's like the whole in in the whole thing that, that i've yeah at the end of the day there's a third party and as nick zabo says trusted third parties are security holes and the idea of Bitcoin is remove them entirely. And I think that's why Bitcoiners and Lightning has not jumped on the DeFi train is because nobody's really solved the underlying problem. They've just put a layer on top of a trusted third party, a couple of trusted third parties, but like two or three max. 
I mean, even the even the Bitcoin, the wrapped Bitcoin, as they call it on Ethereum, is just Bitcoin held in a multi-sig at Digo. Like it's just in an account at a centralized. You're going places that, that I do not know what you mean, but I I, I, okay. I get the okay, sorry. I get the idea. No, I get it though. I get it. Yeah, for okay. sure. Basically, you're giving your um, uh, Bitcoin to a company, and then they are giving you a token equal to that Bitcoin that they will let you withdraw onto Ethereum, and now you're able to trade that in the DeFi environment. Um, but really, at the end of the day, somebody else is just holding your Bitcoin for you. So I know Pomp doesn't have Ethereum. He doesn't hold Ethereum. He doesn't think it's sound money. What do you mm-hmm. think? Same. Um, I think uh, Ethereum is kind of that uh, under fundamental concept of uh, the token. The Ethereum token is there to make the blockchain work. And we want to run applications on the blockchain um, and we want everybody to connect to the blockchain rather than the other way around. That the blockchain is there to secure the money. I mean, if you ask your typical Ethereum, the developer, whatever it is, what the monetary policy is, they just say whatever's best. They say minimum viable right. inflation, which means there's no monetary policy. Well, that's what the monetary yeah. policy is the United States government. So that's exactly right. It's minimum uh, viable inflation. And, and right now, minimum viable happens to be six trillion dollars. <laughs> so like what you deeply value is the security and the the verif- the verification of that security within yes. bitcoin. Yes, it's the fact that I can run on my computer the entire bitcoin system. I can know 100% without question with the highest assurance as possible that I'm running in a I'm debating in a fair system that nobody else can cheat that has a guaranteed explicit monetary policy that does not change. I don't have to be politically well connected. I don't have to know the developers and make sure that I get in their telegram and say, you really shouldn't increase the inflation rate. Like I don't have to trust somebody else's software. I trust the fact that it survived for 12 years. It is what it is. It's continued to verify. It's continued to work. I don't want widgets. I don't want wing bits and gadgets and stuff on it because every one of those things that you add is just a new attack vector. If it does five things, reliably this is mission critical software this is you don't you don't put you don't put apps on your firmware for the rocket ship that's going to take you to the moon like it is bare bones it is absolutely hardcore broken down every piece of fat is thrown out of it anything that's not needed for mission critical operations is removed why because it's something else that can break it's like would you rather have you're on a rocket ship. Would you rather have a touch screen in front of you or, or a switch? It's like, you're going to probably choose <laughs> exactly. a switch, right? And, uh, uh, and if you have a touch screen, it's not going to be connected to the internet. <laughs> you're not going to be logging into it. Um, it's going to be hardwired directly to your, uh, mm-hmm. to your thing. And uh, if we're going to build a financial system that will depend on this, it can't break. It needs to be. It needs to have three attack vectors, and they need to be wide open and obvious and clear, so that we know exactly how it can be attacked. And everything else needs to be as hardened as humanly possible. Uh, one thing that they advertised about Ethereum early on was that it was Turing complete, which means that essentially any program, the script that they had on it, any program that you can write could be written. And uh, what a uh, a beauty on a great writer in the space that I've read a bunch of pieces from him uh, uh, called it was Turing vulnerable. It means that any attack that you can write, you can write for Ethereum. And uh, what's funny is that they've rolled that back massively over the years because they've realized that that's exactly what it means. It means that their attack surface is massive. You know, if you're, if you're a city, you, and you want to protect it, you build it in a canyon surrounded by cliffs with one entry point, one very explicit entry point. You point all your guns at it and you're solid, right? Nobody can get to you. Uh, Ethereum is like a city with no walls that's sprawling everywhere, everywhere, no, a billion different avenues and nobody even can account for all of them. Um, So that's kind of the mindset. Bitcoin is mission critical hardcore sound money verification above anything and everything else ethereum is how many gadgets can we run uh how many things can we attach to it and uh i think it's i think it's the complete opposite mindset i think it's missing the point 
We can build things. We can build. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I don't know if that's problematic. So I have a question and then a comment, a comment and then a question. Uh, when you're saying that, you know, the blockchain is the tool that they invented to serve the purpose of creating sound money. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why it's in service of the sound money principle. Like, and that makes sense. And that's useful. And that's where all the value that you're describing comes from. It seems like Ethereum is the, they invented some cool stuff. Here's other stuff we can do with it. And like, I don't necessarily think that's problematic, right? Because the blockchain was invented for Bitcoin. And now everyone else is like, there's additional very beneficial applications of the technology called the blockchain. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why it's built for building off of the blockchain. Not the blockchain was like the only thing that existed to serve this purpose. Uh, I don't think Ethereum sure. tries to, it, it just comes down to a problem of people trying to take advantage of these things to serve purposes they weren't built to serve. Um, yeah, I totally get it's it. Like, and, um, and that's uh, the it's confusion. Bad if there are, yeah. It's a completely, uh, it, it's a completely fair comparison. Um, and yeah. like when the first altcoin came around, which was name coin. Well, no, yeah, it was, it was the first one. Uh, I got really excited about it because kind of the beauty of the system at the beginning was that it was a way to fund and build an infrastructure around a completely decentralized application. And uh, name coin was trying to create a DNS system that was decentralized. So DNS is the URLs like www.google.com guyswan.com, you know, whatever the hell it is, but that's controlled by certificate authorities. The, the certificates are, and then there's DNS servers. So if somebody, this is how the pirate bay gets taken down all the time is uh, they just call up the right person and suddenly the website disappears. And uh, so this was a way to create a DNS system, a, a, ledger of all of these URLs that will direct people to the right place that can't be taken down. And I thought that was a really fascinating idea. And I think a lot of people have, have really tried to use this for other things. Um, and I think many of them are making honest attempts to do so. They see it as a potential technology to uh, achieve this. Mm -hmm. My problem is, is that increasingly, the more and more time has passed, the more I've watched these projects is that the application itself is independent from the ledger. It doesn't need the network. And no quote unquote network effect in blockchain. So like for, for example, like, I, like I've, I've seen these kind of die into obscurity over and over, over again. And maybe there's something, maybe, but I just increasingly think it doesn't make sense. The biggest problem of all of these projects is the token is the fact that they're trying to create their own money to bootstrap these networks. And uh, like, so an example was Omni. Um, Omni was an old token that was going to be smart contracts and all this stuff, similar to Ethereum, not, not in the same way. It wasn't trying to be a world computer and all that stuff. And uh, this was actually the platform that Tether was built on, which is uh, the Bitfinex's virtual dollar. Think of it like USDC, except it's for a uh, different company. This is the ultimate, this is the digital dollar that exists in the crypto, basically. And this thing was on top of Omni. And the idea was that Omni was going to be worth something because they're paying fees in Omni to do transactions on the network, right? Well, basically the thing was getting bloated and one day Tether just decided they're going to up, they're going to copy and paste it and they're going to drop it onto a different system because there's nothing about the on that requires them to use it. It's like it's open code. Like you can copy and paste it. You can copy and paste it. You can put it on Ethereum. You can copy and paste it. You can put it on Namecoin. You can put it anywhere. The token is irrelevant. And what happened? Omni died. Omni went from one that had like the second highest, I think I actually passed Bitcoin at one point, like volume on the network. And it was worth a reasonable amount of money and tons of people invested in it and thought it was a freaking future. It's got these great applications that everybody's using and it's damn near vanished. It doesn't have any volume anymore. I think it was like a couple hundred thousand dollars worth or something in capital. And that's just because somebody's trading like a hundred dollars worth or $200 worth a day. So it's, it's essentially as dead as an altcoin gets. Um, and the idea was that it, none of the value was trapped in the token. 
no matter what application is built on top of it, if it creates its own token, the token then has to compete in the monetary sphere and it can't avoid doing so. You know, I can make payment services and smart contracts and uh, really clever chat messaging and tipping services for dirt. Like I can put dirt in a safe somewhere and build all of these things on top of it and make an app. But the idea is that we don't want to exchange something that doesn't have any value. And at the end of the day, we want to speak the same language. So it doesn't, the, the application is not going to give value to the money. If the money is valuable, we will build applications for it. And that's why the underlying, the real and 99.9% .9 use case for this thing, for this technology is to secure a money. And then with that, we will do fascinating things. We will do smart contracts. They've got smart, Lightning Network is a smart contract. And now with a, there's a new tech called Shadow Chain that enables you to run completely arbitrary applications. Essentially anything that's running on Ethereum right now, you can now run on Bitcoin. Uh, it's just off chain attached to a Bitcoin contract. Um, that's a lot of fancy sounding words, but basically it means there's no reason that we can't build all of this stuff with Bitcoin. It's just that the, the money is the network effect. The money is the standard and the money is the Lindy effect. And any altcoin is going to have to compete with that. And I just think it's the, the biggest crux. The technology might be fascinating, but I think the token is what's going to kill them. I have, a, I have a question for you. So kind of playing the, this isn't the devil's advocate question at all, but it also completely is. Uh, sure. So yeah. I'm kind of completely on board with the uh, potential consequences of the status quo way of doing things and want to believe in Bitcoin's future to secure money and be sound money. Uh, what are the black swan tail risks where Bitcoin could could go wrong or not be versatile? Like what could go wrong to Bitcoin or in what ways is it designed to uh, counter those remedies? And you okay. don't have to go too, too low level here, but essentially can, you know, a group of people, a government, any person decide to cancel Bitcoin? Can we turn off electric? Like what are the circumstances and where, where Bitcoin really takes a hit from external influence? Okay. And if like SHA-256 and quantum commuting, computing could, could break that, like what would that do? That, that's gotcha. like, okay. Sure, sure. P equals um, NP. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's, uh, well, I'll save the quantum computing for a second. Uh, as far as like governments and stuff, like this thing is a network in the end. So there are always ways to attack a network. One of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is that it is DDoS resistant, which any any uh, decentralized network, that is 99% like the bulk of the problems is somebody can flood it because nobody has control over who can join or like, like there's no, there's no white list, right? Like if, if you're participating in the network, it's decentralized, anybody can join, anybody can leave, et cetera, et cetera. So you could just flood the network. Well, that's the beauty of Bitcoin fees is that it's going to cost you money to flood the network with information or you're just going to get ignored. So, uh, and then of course, with proof of work, that's DDoS resistant because it's just proof of work just means that you're putting real resources into securing the network. So you can't do it without playing that game. Kind of the fundamental pieces of the network, I think, are secure. The, there's always running the risk of a bug. And there have been bugs in the past, and there have even been bugs in the not too recent past. 2018 bug, it was very hard to exploit, and it had to be a miner with a lot of hash power to do it. So it would have been an incredibly expensive bug, but it would have been a bad bug. There are always software bugs. This is always a problem. But the, the longer we don't change, this is kind of the idea of why you don't break the consensus to upgrade the network, which is a perspective that altcoins have, is that we're just going to, you know, six every six months, we're going to completely break and create a new security thing. And we're going to have new rules and we're going to have new smart contracts and new scripts and stuff. Whereas Bitcoin is like, everything is backwards compatible. We don't break consensus for any reason, unless it's a nuclear scenario where this thing is dead, unless we fix it. And that is because Security of code and security of cryptography 
is 99% how long it has survived. Like it's referred to as the Lindy effect. We don't really know cryptography is secure. It's an assumption. But if it exists for 20 years in the wild, everybody has tried to beat it to death and it, and it survives, well then we relatively know it survives. And every, every new year that it uh, continues to survive, the longer we expect it to last into the future. And at the end of the day, this is a cryptographic system. And SHA-256 is one of the most reliable uh, open standards that we have. Um, and it has really survived the test of time. Uh, that's, why, that's why Satoshi picked it. Now, there are little things like uh, it uses a single port on the internet. So you could have a really, uh, really serious attack on the internet and like shutting down ports and all major routing uh, networks and stuff like that. And you'd really bifurcate the network. You'd cause some crazy problems. Great Firewall of China could try to shut down all traffic. But herein is one of the other beautiful things about Bitcoin is the reason you keep the block size small is so that you can sneak through every single information crack anywhere in the world. All you need is a megabyte of data. You can squeeze, it's, it's easy to shut down a terabyte. It's really hard to shut down a megabyte. You can do megabyte over broadband, like low band radio. There's a satellite network that doesn't care about any of the jurisdictions that is constantly broadcasting down to the planet. You can put it, you can fit, you can mine Bitcoin over Tor uh, and you can change the port number. There's a lot of, and what's funny is that all of these attacks are, have really good research and are written up by Bitcoin developers because they're making sure to mitigate these attacks. Mm. It is that those are the cypherpunks and those are the hackers and they're thinking the beauty of it is that they work out the ways to kill Bitcoin first and then they patch them. Interesting. Um, uh, now, uh, and that's the whole, that's the whole idea is that this thing is not about, you know, creating a whole bunch of widgets and stuff. And, uh, it's, it's about creating a hardened core. Cause those are all new attack vectors. They we're discovering still ways to hurt it. So that's the focus. That's what you do at the core level is you find a new way to hurt it and then you fix it. And, uh, uh, now back to, uh, quantum computing. So this is something I'll admit I, I had been really worried about this at a, basically when I knew very, very little about quantum computing, it's kind of a boogeyman and it's a really, it's a really big term, you know, it's like cloud mm. computing or something like that. Like it doesn't mean a whole lot and it's really hard to dig into and it's super abstract. So it's re it was really easy for me to think that, Oh God, it's just like a magic wand. Um, uh, but it seems to me the more and more I've dug into it um, and I've spoken with a number of people and I've been meaning to actually do an episode on this. I really should. Um, there are a couple of people that I had conversations with that would be great to come on the show to dig into it. But basically quantum computing is uh, the idea of, well, I, I guess it's not really necessary to get into uh, <laughs> what the actual like qubit or whatever is doing, but like a normal computer is a zero or a one and uh, a uh, quantum computer can sit in this in-between state so that really large computations, think about like you could put the input and then the output. And if everything was sitting perfectly in the middle, there would kind of be this, this resistance and or this flow for something to line up a certain specific way in which the input then equaled the output. So rather than crunching all the potential ones and zeros, everything sits in the middle and then just kind of flows toward what fits. Um, and so you would potentially be able to get secret keys from people's public half of it from an encryption system. Mm -hmm. So um, do you consider it to be a tail risk at this point? I don't anymore in the short term. Maybe in the very, 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 very distant long term. But the problem with it is, is that it tends to move the issue. It doesn't solve the problem of the massive, like the beauty of uh, SHA-256 is that the key space that you could have is basically larger than the number of atoms that exist in the known universe. Like 
it's such a large key set as to be hilariously stupid to even pretend that you could just test it all. Um, and in fact, you could a billion people could generate a billion of them at random every second for every day. And still, nobody's ever going to guess any of them. It gets such a huge space as to be astronomical. There's a great piece by 21, I mean, excuse me, a great piece by Durjiji called 21 Lessons. And uh, I actually read the whole number out loud. And it takes me like 45 seconds or whatever to get through the whole number. It's, it's hilarious and it was a lot of fun. But uh, quantum computing, the idea of like the quantum computers that we have, like everybody's like, oh, it only takes like a thousand or 2000 qubits, which is the, the measurement kind of like CPU power, like gigahertz, a uh, thousand to 2000 to potentially break SHA-256. Well, it also happens to be the way it's built today extremely specific like there's no such thing as a general quantum computer it doesn't work the same way as a general computer like my computer i can just feed it all sorts of inputs and outputs mm. and programs and i can get it to run all of them why because it can error correct and it can run a thousand different courses in it like it can do anything arbitrarily all of the quantum computers that exist are literally hard-coded routes, which means that for any input that you give it, it has to have a completely different computer for the input. So uh, what it, the problem of trying to compute a, a huge key for like standard encryption is that you have to compute every single possible key that could go into it. Whereas the problem of a quantum computer is that you don't have to compute every single key, but you have to virtualize every path that you could take. So it, rather than fixing the problem, it kind of just moves it to a different place. And the thing that they can't figure out in quantum computing is error correction. So they can't build a general quantum computer and they've not even come close to that so far. They've built specific quantum computers. In fact, the one by, the one recently that like Trump Google. signed a thing and said, yeah, yeah, Google. Basically, I couldn't, it was funny. I read like 13 articles about it and nobody could tell me what it computed. And this is a big indicator that it's not as, is not as impressive as you would think. What, I was like, what did they compute? What is it? And uh, eventually I dug down into some papers from some sources that were linked from this to this to this. And it literally appears that they've created a really powerful random number generator which is a whole world of different. It's not even in the same book as reverse computing a public key to a private key, like breaking encryption. And uh, uh, to do that, to be able to just feed a public key, which is a different input for every single one of them, right now, the way it is designed, it would literally need a separate quantum computer for every single one of them and all of the circuits and all of the design of the thing would have to be unique to mm. that key so it would take literally a billion dollars of resources for every single one that they tried to compute and they have many orders of magnitude too few qubits to get anywhere near SHA-256 maybe maybe in the future but I think it's a whole lot of hype that people think we're two years away, three years away. I think we're three decades away, maybe five, if it comes around. But at the end of the day, I think we will see it coming well before it actually happens. Like SHA-1 uh, was an old encryption algorithm, and we basically knew it was unsafe 10 years before it was ever publicly broken. So it was a full decade that we knew this day was coming, that SHA-1 just wasn't safe anymore. And uh, when, uh, so if, if we get to an era with quantum computing where there's actually a general quantum computer and they solve those fundamental problems, um, I, think, uh, I think we'll know it well before we get there that it really is on the horizon. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin can be upgraded. It can be created a new key signature system. We can create a, uh, a new hashing algorithm. 
it's not a good scenario. It would be a really, really rough transition, but the bigger and more valuable this thing gets, the more likely it is, the more eyes are on it to protect it. So. Got it. Well, thank you for walking us through all those scenarios. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, sorry. It was a little long, long nope. ended there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's complicated. It's, it's the, uh, yeah. it is the question. So it's worth going through uh, the answers there. We just have two more quick questions for you. Uh, and mm-hmm. then we'll let you get on with uh, everything else you're doing. And we appreciate you taking the time to, to go through our questions. So my yeah, question sure. for you is if you have a specific kind of order sequencing you recommend. So someone, you know, it's really, this has piqued their interest in the whole Bitcoin crypto universe. Do you have mm-hmm. kind of a learning path or a charted course or just some general direction? So someone just doesn't just stare at the, the Mount Everest of information, not even aware that there's 30,000 Mount Everests of equal size behind, under, and around it. Uh, yeah. Just some, some way to take their hand and walk them through self-educating a little bit in this universe. Honestly, um, I've been working on a Bitcoin beginner series. I'm not going to say when it would be out because it's something that takes, it's been taking me a really long time. Because it's um, complicated. Because <laughs> it's so complicated. Much. But uh, honestly, I would start, and most people would actually argue against this, but I really suggest people start with getting a little skin in the game by $50 worth. Um, because you're not going to, the, a big part of it is motivation. You know, like, like, is like, why do I need to learn? Like, if you're going to, if you have to do 20 hours of research before you even start playing with a thing, you're not going to do it. Nobody plays a play. Nobody's going to buy a PlayStation five. If you can open the Xbox right out of the box and just start playing. And it takes 30 hours of homework to play the PlayStation five. You know, it's, it just, nobody's going to get over that hurdle. So, and you know, if you can freely risk $50, you know, you spend $50 going out to eat somewhere. Uh, buy a little bit and look at it, then learn how to withdraw it. Like just look up a video on YouTube. How do I withdraw Bitcoin? Uh, get a good, uh, get a good wallet. Start playing around with lightning. There's a great wallet called the breeze wallet, B R E E Z. And uh, it's one of my absolute favorites. And that technology is getting more and more fun and you can withdraw to that wallet. Just start getting familiar with it. Uh, download one of the clients for the desktop and look at it. You don't have to put anything in it. Just start clicking on things and playing with it. Get a uh, get used to you know what the hell a seed is. Like that's your that's your key. That's your uh, key to the kingdom. And uh, YouTube is a great resource. Um, I hope to have a lot of resources with that. There's a lot of episodes on Bitcoin Audible that will kind of get you introduced to it. A good friend of mine and who has tons of great videos is BTC Sessions. Um, he has a lot of great videos on YouTube. And uh, actually one, one that I just um, mentioned a minute ago uh, just about the economic value and the idea of valuing Bitcoin, a great episode. And it, uh, it was actually a piece that I read by Knutz von Holm uh, called everything there is divided by 21 million and it's a really great just conceptual video a lot of little things like that uh bitcoin audible always we've covered a ton of that kind of stuff Uh, those are all great resources but baby steps buy a little bit on cash app swan bitcoin um swanbitcoin.com slash guy actually you get 10 there you go now absolutely do that i got a ref link i got a ref link i totally yeah can't forget that um so uh if you actually sign up with uh, swan bitcoin uh and you use slash guy uh you actually get 10 bucks free so that's a that's an easy way to start and uh and then start playing around with it I, i think you'll naturally start to learn and you have the right questions to ask after you own a little bit you know well, you should definitely uh, go and listen to Bitcoin Audible, Audible and Shitcoin Insider and learn more <laughs> about Guy and consume his content. Follow him on Twitter. One last question before you, for you before we sign off is when will Bitcoin hit 100,000? What, what's your prediction? Man, I don't want to sound crazy, but I think before the end of 2021. I don't think that's crazy at all. That's what I've been telling people. Uh, okay. <laughs> and that's based on way less information than you have. So, so that's good. I'm, um, I'm crazy, crazy, crazy bullish right now. I think there's, 
Uh, in fact, there's a great piece by Lynn Alden that I read very recently called uh, Seven Misconceptions uh, About Bitcoin. She has two great pieces on it. Uh, one's just the general bullish case. Um, and uh, I think the next two years are going to be incredibly exciting in the Bitcoin space. And uh, I think we're finally beginning to see the real financialization of this as a legitimate asset on the global sphere. And I don't think we can discount, you know, as more people get in, as corporations are adding this to their treasury balance sheets, it's unlike any other asset. Its supply cannot change. It's perfectly inelastic. The only thing that can move as more of an economy embraces it as more corporate treasuries use it as a hedge or an investment decision. The only thing that can account for it is the price and it has to go up if that thing grows. So I think there's huge potential in the next two years. Well, I think that is a beautiful answer to that question, Guy. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on our podcast. We, we greatly appreciate it. And yeah, we're going to sign off. All right, man. Thanks guys. Been a lot of fun. Absolutely. That wraps up our conversation with, with Guy. I thought it was a really interesting talk. Uh, a few of my takeaways are just the concept of hard money and how in order to have hard money, you have to have a fixed supply. Um, and the dollar does not have that. The dollar, the people, the U.S. government is creating uh, new money, printing money all day, every day. And that's that problem is only getting worse. And from that, um, there are a lot of second and third order problems being created that, you know, I wasn't fully aware of before having this conversation with Guy. Um, but obviously he's thought a lot about this and um, a lot of those things are more clear to him. Um, another thing is the eventuality of the tokenization of real estate and how, um, you know, right now you have to participate in the debt markets in order to purchase real estate uh, effectively. But I think in the future, these markets will become much more efficient when um, they are, are tokenized in the form of um, in the form of cryptocurrency and, and being on the blockchain. Um, and another thing is, you know, even though Guy is very bullish on Bitcoin, he's not so radical that he exists totally outside of the system. He still, you know, owns real estate and, and has fiat currency to pay for it. Um, and it's sort of like you know, you still have to play the the normal games within society, even though he has these really big uh, beliefs, which I think are good. Another thing is um, that every additional third party um, fact checker that is involved in any sort of business or um, really organization is a potential security leak. And I thought that was really interesting. And, you know, I've seen it be true and the amazing thing about Bitcoin is that there are no third parties. Um, but those are my takeaways. Lewis, what did you think? Yeah, I had a lot of fun in this conversation and re-listening to it. I think that it's just so fun to listen to someone who's such an expert and so, so passionate about a topic in not just one angle, but pretty much all the angles, right? Like he geeks out about the technology, he geeks out about the economics, he geeks out about the social implications, he geeks about teaching it, how to make it more digestible to the beginner. So I found a lot of value in Guy sharing his time with us. I have four main ideas from the conversation. The first one is that, like you said, it's sort of an eventuality, the way the game is currently being played, that there will be some sort of debt crisis. And you had asked the question, how do we best prepare for that? And his answer was simple, divest into things with real value. So he gives this car keys example, which was my second takeaway, that that was a really cool and really helpful example. But he gives the car keys example as to, you know, you can print more car keys, but that doesn't mean there's more cars. And the natural consequence of systems where that happens is a debt crisis. And the way to uh, be prepared for that is to divest into things that you cannot simply print more of. So if you trade your dollars, which are, like we said, kind of fragile made up things for, for cars, for example, the car is going to retain its value a lot better than the dollars, which don't have any intrinsic value. Uh, second one was that car keys example, which I kind of blended into my first one. So I'm going to jump right into number three. Uh, just that one of the best ways to learn about a subject and really position yourself as an expert is to read the best topics and the best papers in that subject. 
So we often like to ask in the bonus round or throughout the podcast, you know, how do you get smarter about this topic? How are you self-educating to stay on the cutting edge? And Guy's answer is, I publish a, a podcast where I read out loud, slowly and deliberately, the very best new materials on this topic. And we always like to discuss, you know, what's the best way for someone to go about learning this thing? And I think forcing yourself to publicly publish yourself reading the very best topics and papers in that area is a pretty interesting learning strategy that I think is worth considering if there's something complicated that you're trying to establish your own credibility in and establish your, your base of knowledge in. And my last thing is that we've learned this again and again. We had Lee Lefevre tell us that, you know, circumstance is an amazing teacher. And I think that when I asked Guy, how do I get started in Bitcoin. It's this Mount Everest of information and such a difficult thing to, to learn. And he said, just, just go buy Bitcoin. And at that point, you'll know what questions to ask. So oftentimes the best way to learn something is to get started and just follow the passion and the natural curiosities and the questions that will arise. If you want to learn programming, this is something every single programmer we've said has said, or we've had on has said, uh, find some small thing that you want to build and then go about learning how to build that thing. And I think that is such a useful recipe for learning any topic that I found to be an interesting kind of meta lesson. But that is all I'm taking away from this conversation with Guy Swan. If you got nearly as much value as we did or feel as if you learned something, all we ask is that you make sure you're subscribed to The Lewis and Kyle Show on whatever platform you are listening to this on right now so you can be notified of future episodes. And if you really enjoyed it, please leave a rating or review on iTunes to show your appreciation and help us grow our show and get awesome people like Guy in the future. That is all for this episode. We'll see you in a week with the next one.